I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke. If you'll turn with me to the Gospel of Luke and Luke chapter 2. Turn with me to Luke 1, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 1. I'll begin reading in verse 46 and I'll read down through verse 55. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. We'll read down to verse 55. God's Word is holy. It's without error. It's our only rule of faith and practice. And so let me invite you to stand as we read God's holy and inerrant Word. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Oh, Father, we do thank you, for you are a mighty God and you are a great God. And Lord, we have seen answers to prayer in just this last week. We thank you for your healing of Daryl Hallmark, and we thank you for the doctors being able to diagnose and effectively treat him. We pray for he and Renee, ask that your peace and strength would be in their life. Lord, others in this congregation have been praying about matters that are very difficult and weighty on their hearts. And Lord, you have answered and you have answered in power. And we give you thanks for that. Father, as we read this song of Mary, as we study it, we know, Lord, that it is truly a prayer. Our songs are truly prayers lifted up to thee. And Lord, we pray that you would make us increasingly a people of prayer people who seek your face. And Lord, we ask now that you will teach us and guide us. We pray most of all that the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted and truly lifted up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but it is really a blessing to be able to go into Walmart these days. And you say, how? And I'll say, because in the background, in the background of Walmart, all through the store, I hear, hark the herald, the angels sing. This is in Walmart. Glory to the newborn king. Or to be in a restaurant this week and hear in the background, think of this, think of the depth of this theology. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Behold the incarnate deity, pleased as men with men to dwell. Behold, he is our Emmanuel. To think of what's being sung in public is a blessing. And you may say, well, that's, that's, no, it's actually a testimony to people. They're hearing the truth of God through hymns, through carols. You know, carols at Christmas are very, very much a part of the way that we celebrate Christmas. It's very much a part of our memory. It's very much a part of our history. It's very much a part of our worship. Several years ago, we had the first Sunday of December off, and we went to another church here in Birmingham just to see what that church was like, to listen. And uh, evidently, they thought the carols had gone out of style. And they sang songs we didn't even recognize the Christmas songs they were singing. And I left thinking, no, 
I love the carols that we sing at Christmas. They bring back so much. They mean so much. I wonder what are your favorite carols? What do you like to sing? You like to sing um, Silent Night? Or you like to sing Little Town of Bethlehem? Or to sing It Came Upon a Midnight Clear? What do you like to sing? The songs of Christmas were given to us even from the beginning. Certainly not a little town of Bethlehem or Silent Night. But when Christ, the time around when Christ was born, is filled with songs. They're songs that come out of the heart of God's people. They're songs that come out of the heart of the angels. There are actually four songs that are sung by God's saints. One is by Zacharias, the, the uh, father of John the Baptist. Another is from Simeon. It actually was talked about this morning as the choir sang. Another one was from the angels. Glory to God in the highest. The last one, or the one that some ways is most widely known, is the Song of Mary. And it's called the Magnificat because she says, My soul exalts the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. What I'd like for us to do today is to look at this song of Mary. It's a song that is exalts the Lord. It speaks about His greatness. It speaks about His work. It speaks about His power. And I want us to think about some aspects of God that this song of Mary so clearly presents for us. And I believe it will be a blessing to us as we move toward the birth of our Lord. Look with me, first of all, in this psalm at verse 48, if you would. Look with me there. It says, For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. And we praise God as we look at this psalm because God is the one who is mindful of his people. He is mindful of his people. The word that is used in verse 48, for he has regard, it means to have concern with action. And what the writer is saying to us, what Mary is saying to us of this psalm, is that she is saying that God has looked to us, not with just concern, but it's an active concern. It's a concern that reaches out. It's a concern that works in his people's lives. During the time that Mary sang this song, she had just heard of the birth of her son. It was a time when God's people thought that he had forgotten them. It's a time when God's people, as they looked at their lives, they were living under terrible oppression, and they felt as though God had simply deserted them. Many of them did. For 400 years, God had not said a word to his people. When you close the Old Testament with the book of Malachi... That 400-year gap from the time of Malachi to the time that God comes to Mary to the angel Gabriel is a period of silence. And God's people wondered, where is God in this? He's left us. He's deserted us. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt as though you're abandoned by God? As though God is not near? It had been 600 years since they had seen the Shekinah glory of God over the tabernacle, over the temple. It had been 600 years just before the Babylonians invaded that God had written Ichabod across his people and said, you're abandoned. And they wondered, where is God? Where is God? And now Mary and her family, Joseph, all the Jews who lived in the land of Israel lived under a maniac. His name was Herod. And Herod was a person who had an, a lust for evil. He was a murderer. He thought nothing of killing others. As you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ is born, he thinks nothing of sending his soldiers in and killing every child two years and under around the land of Bethlehem. Someone was said during the time of Herod, they said, it was a time in which no man's life was sacred and no woman's honor was protected. They were cruel times. Herod would kill members of his own family, and he did because he was paranoid, wanting to keep his power. 
This was the land that Mary lived in. This was the time that she lived in. And the people were wondering, has God forgotten us? Where is he? Let me ask you again the question. Do you ever go through times in your life where you wonder, has God forgotten me? Is he really mindful of what's going on in my life? Why don't you come? Why don't you rescue? Why don't you show yourself how? Well, what Mary wants to remind us of is that he does remember. And that he is mine. And that he is active. And that he is working. And sometimes in our life we see that in a very visible way. We see it in a very powerful way that stands out to us. And there are times in our life that we can look back on and we know that God was at work and we know that his power was present and we know that he has answered specific prayers in our life. But there are also times when it seems as though God is silent. But yet he is continuing to do his work, continuing to work his might and his power. You know... For some, Christmas is a difficult time because it reminds us, it brings back memories. We think about those who are no longer here to celebrate Christmas with us. And it can be difficult. We think about disappointments. We think about loneliness at times during Christmas. It's that type of season. It has that way about it. And what God is saying to us through this beautiful, gracious, exalting song of Mary is that God is mine, that he has regard for us, that he's acting with active concern in our life. The second thing that we see in this passage is that we praise our God as one who is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Look with me at what she says in verse 49, For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. Then look in verse 51. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and He has exalted those who are humble. That's power at work. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel His servant. God is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. This word here, mighty one, is a word that's just one word in the original. It's a word that is the same in comparison in the Old Testament to a name of God that we looked at this summer. It's the name El Shaddai. It means the Almighty One. And it's a word that just doesn't mean that God is all-powerful. That is enough. But it means even more than that. It means that God in His power is covenantally bound to His people. Through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father has woven His promises into our life. And He is covenantally bound to us. And so what this name, El Shaddai, what this name, the Mighty One, means is not only that God is all-powerful, Here's the wonder and the beauty of God's grace that He is all powerful on our behalf as His children. It's a name given to God, people, for them to call upon Him who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who moves and acts on behalf of His children. The word mighty one is an interesting word. Alfred Nobel, that's right, of the Nobel Peace Prize, when he developed an explosive made out of nitroglycerin, he went to the Greek dictionary to try to give a name for his explosive material. And he truly chose the word that is used here for the mighty one of God. It is dunamis. It's the word that we get our word dynamite from. God is a powerful, powerful God. This happened at Easter, and if, excuse me, at Christmas. If you would, look with me at the book of Revelation. 
Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Turn with me there in your Bible. And when we see the power of God at work, and there are other times in our life where we don't see the power of God at work, but again, it doesn't mean that He's not acting. And when we think about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, we think about a time that seemed to be very peaceful. We think about it as a time in which uh, we sing about, oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. We think about peace. But I want to say to you that when Christ came, it was a time of war. It was a time of great war, and it was a time of great exercise of the power of God. And if you would, look with me at Revelation chapter 12. There is a great deal of symbolism here, and I won't try to go through it in detail, but give you enough to help us understand what is going on at the birth of Christ. Let's begin in Revelation 12, and I'll begin in verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Who is this woman? This woman is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the faithful people of God, the elect, the covenantal people of God. And they are represented by Mary, by Mary herself. She is of God's covenantal people, the person, the woman, that he chose to fulfill his promise in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, that a woman, the seed of a woman, will crush the head of a serpent. She is the representative for God's people because she is the one who will bear God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's speaking of Mary, but it's speaking of the faithful church as a whole. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. This is God's understanding of the church. The church is at the very center of his purposes. She has 12 stars on her head. And I know you know the number 12 and how often it appears in Scripture. It's the number of God's people. There are 12 tribes. There are 12 apostles. 12 disciples. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And so this is a very, very powerful red dragon. And of course, we know who this is. This is Satan. And so Satan is there at the birth of Christ. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Those are the fallen angels. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And so there was war going on spiritually when Christ was born. And you see the physical manifestation of this war in the hatred of Herod being directed against the child Christ. And she gave birth to a son, a male, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. So he is the ruler. He is the one who comes. Messiah. And then her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And we know that our Lord Jesus Christ would live out his life. And then he would live it out perfectly. And he would give his life with a perfect sacrifice for sin. And then he will ascend into heaven. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. That's that three and a half years that you see again and again in the book of Revelation. And verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old. 
who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Shorthand, God wins. God always wins. And because we are his people, we win. But the point of this passage that I want us to see, and I want us to be reminded of, is that we look around us and we think, well, I wonder what's going on. There doesn't seem to be much going on. Or we may say there's a lot going on. What we have to remember is that God is always at work. And on that very still night when Christ was born, there was absolute war being waged in the spiritual realm. And God wins. He is all-powerful. The greatest work of God's power that we see on an ongoing basis in this life is something that we have all experienced if we're Christians. And it's something that you may have witnessed if you're not a Christian. One of the most amazing and absolute things that you can ever see and ever be involved in is to sit across from another person and to share the gospel with them. Maybe you shared the gospel with them repeatedly. Maybe you shared the gospel with them for years. And they call you one day and say, Hey Tom, I just want to let you know, I became a Christian last week. And then you have an opportunity later to sit down for lunch with them again. It's the same face. It's a different person. That is the miracle of God raising someone spiritually from the dead and giving them newness of life. And it happens every day on the face of the earth. God is a powerful God. And He changes lives. I hope that you are sharing Christ with others. I hope that you have someone on your heart that you want to speak with about the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that you take time to ask that person out for lunch. Or to ask that person, just call them on the phone and talk with them. And I hope that you speak with them about the Lord. The greatest gift that you can give anyone is to share the gospel. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God and the salvation to all who believe in the Jew first. And also to the Gentile. Mary praises and thanks God that he is a powerful, powerful (coughs) on behalf of his people. The third thing that we see in this song of Mary, we turn back to Luke chapter 1. We see it in verses 50 and 54, let me read those verses. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. And then verse 54, he has given help to Israel his servant in remembrance of his mercy. We praise God as one who is merciful. As one who is merciful. You ever ask yourself the question, why Christmas? Why do we even have Christmas? Why was Christ born? You ask yourself that question. Some people answer that question by saying it's because God is a, a just God. You know, God did not have to send His Son. And Jesus did not have to come. He was, their harmony and their will was certainly together, but it did not have to happen. And some people say, well, the reason that Jesus came is because of God's justice. That's not the reason that Jesus came. God could have remained a just God without Jesus coming. God could have simply seen us in our sin, looked upon us in our sin, and left us alone. He didn't have to do anything on our behalf. God 
God, the birth of Christ explains God's mercy, not his justice. Because the mercy of God is what sent his son to this earth in order to pay his justice. What does mercy mean when it's used in scripture? It means having pity on those who are helpless. It means having pity on those who cannot help themselves. And that's exactly what God is doing toward us. Spiritually, we are helpless. Spiritually, we cannot pay the penalty of our sin. That is the reason that hell is eternal. Because even though we may spend eternity in hell, we cannot pay our sin. We cannot atone for ourselves. There is only one who can pay for our sin. And that is Christ himself. And that is what mercy is about. It is God sending his own son, fully God and fully man, and coming to this earth and paying the penalty for our sin. Paying the penalty for all those who place their faith and trust in Christ alone is Savior. This is why Jesus on the cross, he cried out just before he delivered himself into his Father's hands, he cried out, it is finished. It's something that means literally it is paid in full. He paid the penalty for sin. And God wants us, he calls us, To receive that as a gift. You know, as a kid, I was thinking about this week, thinking about, as a child, things I received at Christmas. I remember one of the first big Christmas gifts I got was an army set with army soldiers. And I remember how big the box was, and I remember how many soldiers were in it, and I remember it had some tanks, and it had all sorts of things And I would take it out of the yard and I would play with it. That's back when kids played with army things. And I remember getting a bike. I remember getting a Stingray bicycle with a banana seat and high handlebars and being able to ride it all over the neighborhood. And I remember as an older kid getting a slot car track and racing cars with my friends. I got all those gifts. But I didn't pay for a single one of them. I receive them as a gift. And that's what God calls us to do, is to understand that He is paid for our sins. And He wants us to receive it, not as something we pay for, but as something that we simply accept and trust in Christ for our salvation. If we come to Christ, we come surrendering our heart. We come repudiating ourself and our self-will and our sin. That's called repentance in the scripture. A turning from our sinful self and a turning to Christ. And we come to Him by faith, trusting in Him alone. No longer ourselves, no longer anything else. We abandon everything. And we cling to Christ alone as the source of salvation. Have you ever come to Christ? Have you ever truly trusted in Him? Why are you waiting? How many times will the gospel call have to go out to your life before you respond? Why will you not surrender to Christ? Is He not wiser? Is He not gooder? Is he not more loving and more merciful than yourself? Why do you wait to surrender? Why do you wait to trust? Has he not kept all of his promises? Has he not kept all of his promises in detail? Has he not explained and demonstrated that he is trustworthy? Why have you not trusted? in Him. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you
you come to him. God's gift at Christmas is his son. Will you receive him? Will you trust him? Will you know him? Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful song of Mary. We thank you, Lord, for how this song of praise focuses upon your character, that you are a God who is mindful of your children, that you remember us. And we thank you for the way that it focuses on your power, that you are a God who works in spite of the mechanisms of this world, and that, Lord, you work even through the acts of men to bring about your glorious and your holy purposes. Lord, forgive us of times in our life where we wrestle with you. And we say in our heart of hearts and often vocalize, Lord, where are you? Have you forgotten us? Forgive us, Lord. For you never forget. And you continue to work. Oh, Lord, give us greater faith to trust you each day. Father, please forgive us of not seeking you, for you have made yourself clear. You have fulfilled your word. You have kept your good and precious promises. You have made yourself known. Oh, Lord, we pray that we would surrender our will to you, that we would trust in you daily. I pray, Lord, for a person here who does not know Christ. I pray they would delay no longer. And I pray, O oh Lord, that they would bow down before you and they would offer up their lives to you and say, O oh Lord, take my life. Forgive me of my sin. Work in me now the powerful work of your Holy Spirit. And give to me the gift of salvation. That even this moment, I might have eternal life. And that I might walk with you, O Lord, forever. What greater joy, what greater comfort, what greater knowledge. Can there ever be than to know Christ? Oh, Lord, may they know him today. May we stand for the benediction. And now may God's great grace and his mercy and his peace be with us both now and forevermore. Amen.